We are in Acts chapter 15. So in Acts chapter 15, we, we run into some internal tension in this early Christian movement. Acts chapter 15 verses 1 through 5 sets up the problem, sets up the, uh, the issue, the debate. You know, the Christian movement has uh, always, has always, from the beginning, had uh, difficulty from without. External, external pressures, external persecution, external tension. As, uh, as Christianity um, grows out of, out of Judaism, um, Jews persecute Christians, um, in, as we see in, in Acts. We also see that the, the, the Gentiles, the, the government, the state, through the centuries has persecuted Christianity. Uh, but the reality is, going all the way back to the very beginning, there's not just pressure from without. There's not just external difficulties and challenges. Um, there are pressures from within. There are challenges from within. We see that probably most intensely here with this issue that we're going to study in Acts chapter 15. But we've already seen it from, from the very earliest days of the Christian movement because there's people involved. When you have people involved, you're going to have challenges and difficulty and differences and hurt feelings and people getting left out and divisions and so on. So all the way back to Acts 6, I mean, it just seems like a brand, brand spanking new church and there's tensions from within. You remember the issues in Acts chapter 6, the tension from within? They had to appoint men who were full of the Holy Spirit. Um, yes, taking care of certain widows. Seems that the church was pretty good to take care of Jewish widows, <laughs> but was less uh, careful and less deliberate about taking care of Greek-speaking widows. So some of the tensions early on had to do with cultural differences, um, ethnic divides. And um, we see a, a, a greater, more intensified um, version of that in Act, with the issue in Acts chapter 15. So, things haven't changed much. Christianity has challenges from without difficulties and pressures, external pressures, external challenges, challenges of being a Christian in a, in a, in a really um, adulterous, promiscuous, idolatrous world. But also, to this day, there's challenges from within. Um, diversity, um, differences of views, differences of opinion, differences, different types of convictions, and people... Uh, proliferating the division because of those differences. Acts 15 should give us some um, guidance. So let's just look at the setup in Acts chapter 15 starting with verse 1. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch. Now actually when you're thinking about a map, Antioch is north of Judea. Antioch is north of Judea. S Syrian Antioch uh, is just straight up from, from Judea. So it says they came down from Judea topographically. They came down from Judea from the mountains down to where Antioch was. They're not thinking abstractly like a map. So men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers. Here's the content of their teaching. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses... You cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. 
The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, following that direct line south to Judea, where Jerusalem is, uh, they were telling how the Gentiles had been converted. So as they made their way to the council to discuss, with, to discuss this with the apostles and with the elders in Jerusalem, they were uh, spreading the great news that the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the brothers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Okay. Um, what do you think about these brothers? I mean, here's the, here's the opening line here. Some men came down from Judea to Antioch. So the kind of the mother, the mother hub, if you will. Uh, the birthplace of, of Christianity is Judea. I mean, Jerusalem more specifically, but Jerusalem is in Judea. And some, some people came from that hub of the Christian movement, which is in the heart of the hub of the Jewish faith. They go uh, travel north to Antioch with this teaching. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. How does that... I don't know, how, does, how do these guys hit you, these guys and their teachings? I mean, it might be easy for us, in hindsight, to look back and almost put horns on these guys, like the bad guys. But, but surely you can see some, surely you can understand they have good intentions, don't they? They're not the bad guys. They're actually uh, caring enough. <laughs> they are wrong. They're misinformed. Uh, they're uninformed. Yeah, well, whatever. Same thing. They don't, they don't have this knowledge uh, that they need to have. And so out of their um, conviction, out of their concern for the loss of the souls of these new quasi-brothers and sisters in Christ. They're going to go up and, you know, be, be uh, care enough to confront, I guess you could say. They care enough to confront. So I want us to uh, respect their, uh, I think, as far as we know and as far as Luke describes, they're not evil. Let's respect their intent here, though they're ill-informed, uninformed, or misinformed. And their message is, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. I mean, what, what else do they have to go on? Look what they have to go by. So it, it looks like uh, that through Jesus Christ... All of the promises made to Israel are being fulfilled. These men that come from Judea are believers. These men that come from Judea are Christians. These men that come from Judea are Jewish believers that Jesus is the Messiah. And they believe that Jesus has fulfilled all of the uh, promises and prophecies given to Israel. They are followers of Jesus who say that unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. And they've got plenty to back that up. Look at Genesis chapter 17. And based on what they have to go on, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine them not thinking that. Genesis chapter 17, starting with verse 10. Well, we could start at verse 9. Then God said to Abraham, Genesis 17, verse 9, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. 
Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner. Those who are not of your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Uh, look at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Now that, you know, one thing we might say there in rebuttal is, okay, that's for Abraham and his descendants. We're talking about, we're talking about, uh, covenant people of God who are Gentiles now. <laughs> Exodus chapter 12, verse 48 and 49. Exodus 12, 48 and 49. An alien living among you who wants to celebrate the Lord's Passover must have all the males in his household circumcised. Then he may take part like one born in the land. No uncircumcised male may eat of it. The same law applies to the native born and to the alien living among you. We could look at more, but suffice it to say, there's, there's uh, the only scriptures that they have right now are the Hebrew scriptures. In this early uh, expression of the Christian faith, the scriptures they have are the law and the prophets. And scripture seems quite clear. The scriptures that they have available to them. So as we begin, let's, let's just not, not, not make it so, uh, so obvious who the good guys and the bad guys are. We have that in retrospect. We know the outcome. We know the result. And frankly, <laughs> had, it, had it not gone the way it went, there would be no us. I think that, I think that the, the, the prospect of Christianity reaching widespread, worldwide, uh, Gentile inclusion hangs in the balance with what happens in this, in this council. And there would likely be none of us, unless there's a handful of us that, have, that could trace our heritage all the way back to Abraham. So, of all of the controversies that challenged the church from within, and there's plenty, but this was the big one. This was, this was the big one. This was the most volatile one. Um, and it was uh, not, a, not a simple, not a simple debate, a simple discussion. You can see that this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So this is a big one. Basically the word there for tension uh, and debate or sharp dispute implies that there is a, uh, that, that, that the diversity or the division of opinion runs very, very deep that there's a serious lack of agreement. This same word, um, I don't, I could say it, but it, it's not a familiar sounding word, is the same word that uh, is used in Josephus for um, the kind of, it's used to talk about a riot or a revolt. This sharp dispute or, or, or debate it's a very strong term. So notice that, um, that Paul, who, who navigates all sorts of difficulties and challenges and controversies, when this shows up, he, he is willing to step into a very strong, strident debate. There are some things 
that call for people to stand up in a strident way and um, take it head on. And this is one of those things, because we're talking about an essential. Basically, uh, are people saved by the gospel? Or people saved by the gospel plus circumcision? And this is enough to get Paul going. He shows in Romans chapter 14 and 15, and he shows in 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, he shows lots of prudent, wise ways to navigate people who have differences of opinion. Here's people who have these certain convictions about this, and here's people who have certain convictions about that. You're familiar, perhaps, with Romans 14 and 15 and how Paul gives us uh, wisdom as to how to navigate differences of opinion and conviction in the church. But here, this is not up for discussion. This, this is something that he's going to go to the mat about because this is an essential. This is the, the very heart of the Christian faith that's at stake here. And that is, are people going to be saved out, uh, out of a faith response to the gospel or faith response to the gospel plus, plus circumcision. So, it is interesting that it's not going to be decided based on Paul and Barnabas here in Antioch. These guys came from Judea, they come up to Antioch, and they get into a sharp dispute, and it's not just decided locally with Paul and Barnabas' authority. They are going to take the matter all the way down to Jerusalem. I guess this is a big enough one that it's not going to be decided here and now in this room. We're going to defer to the apostles and to the elders in Jerusalem. Now, uh, in Acts chapter 6, when the Grecian widows were getting neglected, again, it was deferred to the apostles. But in Acts chapter 6, it's just the apostles. I just want you to consider something here. It is interesting that now, uh, as much as perhaps 10 years, um, probably actually more than that, 10 years probably between the Cornelius event and this, most estimate. So, I don't know, 15 years now, as, as, as the whole Christian history has been squeezed into these 28 chapters. Um, first of all, with the uh, Grecian widow neglect controversy, the elders are going to be the ones who decide, excuse me, the apostles are going to be the ones to decide this. Now, a while later, it's going to be the apostles and the elders of Jerusalem. I don't know what to think about that, other than um, the elders have grown. <laughs> the elders at the very, in, the, in, the, in the very kind of uh, baby stages, the, what elders? What elders? You've got the apostles, you've got the eyewitnesses. But now, time has passed, the Jerusalem church has grown stronger, there's been an apostle or two that have been martyred, and now they're turning more and more to the elders, along with the apostles in Jerusalem, to help navigate this controversy. Which I kind of, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. It's encouraging, because the apostles are not holding all of the authority until they die. <laughs> They're starting to share the authority with the elders because that's all there's going to be in a little while. And I, I, I just haven't ever thought about that or noticed that before to see that the elders have a big role in, in this decision as well. In fact, the strongest voice and the voice that carries is an elder in Jerusalem, James, the brother of Jesus, who's not one of the twelve. Yes. Scott, uh, where did Paul and Barnabas get this idea? Because they said, you 
know, the door of faith had been opened to the Gentiles, and they strongly debate these Jewish guys in the church, who didn't seem to get the memo that Paul got. Yes. So, specifically, what's your... Well, um... How come, how come they didn't get the memo? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, Paul got his revelation directly from... Jesus yes, yes. Yes. So he's not teaching circumcision. That's he's right. Arguing hotly against it. That's right. So maybe just he got that memo on the other side. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think we're going to have some insight here because Peter's going to give a speech, then Paul and Barnabas give a little speech, and then James give a speech. Uh, gives a speech, and they're and they're all going to sort of basically lay out the rationale as to why we need to go in this direction, and. And part of it is this, Peter saw with his own eyes. Peter saw with his own eyes that the Holy Spirit of God came upon uncircumcised Gentiles. So the memo <laughs> that it was that, and Paul got that too. Now Paul did receive lots uh, in, in that uh, Damascus Road vision. I think he got the, the, the gist of his, of his gospel there that took this you know, uh, um, persecuting Pharisee to become a missionary to the Gentiles. But I do think that the, the thing that this Judean, this Judean party had not seen is they had not seen what Peter saw and what Paul and Barnabas have seen everywhere they go. And that is the Holy Spirit of God, the same one that came upon the believers in Jerusalem has manifested his presence in uncircumcised Gentile believers as well. So, God is about to reveal that uh, through the testimony of Peter and Paul and Barnabas, and then James is going to get up, who might not have seen it himself yet, but James, one of the elders, the brother of Jesus, is going to get up and sort of summarize all of it, and what he says ends up sort of taking uh, the day. Anything else? Well, Floyd? Wasn't uh, at least one or two of the apostles appointed elders and then it continued to grow in the eldership from church to church? Paul and Barnabas went back to each new church plan and appointed elders. So this, this is a way that the church has expanded in, in settling disputes. Yes. Yes, so we see the, uh, the, the beginnings of uh, the wisdom of God to provide leadership for his people. There were some of the elders that, that stayed in Jerusalem. That's right. Some of the apostles. apostles. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I do think it's telling that the answer is not going to come from Paul and Barnabas, that they entrust they entrust the answer to the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem, and that's where that conversation is going to happen. I like how as they're traveling down to this Jerusalem council, they're sharing this memo uh, of the conversion of the Gentiles along the way, and it pleases everyone. You see that? As they get closer and closer, traveling south from Antioch, this news made all the brothers very glad that uh, as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, after Samaria, the very next province is Judea, they are telling the, uh, the other Christian churches how the Gentiles have been converted, and it made everybody so happy. Then they came to Jerusalem and were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. So, let's not think simply that this is, this is Paul and Barnabas pushing an agenda. This is not Paul and Barnabas um, with some strong conviction and belief trying to get their way. This is Paul and Barnabas reporting everything that God had done. What is, what is happening here on this issue has to do with what God has done. God is going to clear it up for the folks. 
And that's how Peter describes it too. So, verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and, re and required to obey the law of Moses. So first of all, uh, that word for party, the, the word there is, uh, here's how it would be pronounced as I learned uh, to study Greek. I'm rusty, but I can do this. Hire seos. Hire seos. Party. Hire seos. Heresy. Heresy. Now, don't get all wound up. Heresy. You know what heresy is, right? A heresy. Heresy. Um, um, uh, it, it's usually understood to be a, a, a belief that is, has been rejected. A belief that's not orthodox. A, a rejected uh, um, choice. But here it's used of uh, like party or sect or uh, a distinct subgroup. The distinct subgroup. Now, by the way, these are believers. Don't, don't think of the same group that followed that kind of uh, tormented Jesus ministry. They're, they're, they're just like that um, as far as some of their convictions and beliefs. But these are ones that actually follow Jesus. Like Saul of Tarsus would have belonged to, and in, 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 in many ways still does belong to, this subgroup. A Pharisee of Pharisees. So there was a distinct subgroup with very distinct beliefs. This word is used in Acts chapter 5 verse 17. If you're really fast and want to write it down and look it up, that's fine. This, this word is used of the Pharisee, of the, sorry, of the Sadducees in Acts chapter 5 verse 17. The same, the same word, heresy or party or sect or distinct subgroup. It's used again of the Pharisees in chapter 26, verse 5, all the way towards the end of Acts. But perhaps surprisingly, it's used of Christians in chapter 24. It's a distinct subgroup. It's used of Christians in 24, verse 5, 24, verse 14, and 28, 22. So it's not necessarily connote something negative. It just means a distinct subgroup or sect or party. Um, it reminds me that Christians were originally called the Nazarenes. They were the Nazarenes. They were a, a distinct, they were seen as a distinct subgroup within Judaism originally. So you've got Essenes, Herodians, Pharisees, Zealots. Sadducees, Nazarenes. Nazarenes. And what's happening here in Acts chapter 15 is that this distinct subgroup within Judaism is on the verge of no longer, is coming right out of its Jewish banks. <laughs> because no longer, unlike all of the other distinct subgroups within Judaism, no longer will circumcision be required for full participation and membership in this distinct subgroup, those who follow Jesus of Nazareth. So, let's see. Notice the two requirements here that this distinct subgroup is insisting. These were pharisaical, I don't mean pharisaical in the derogatory sense. These were pharisaical believers. Christians who uh, belonged to the Pharisee party who said Gentiles must be, one, circumcised and Gentiles must, two, be required to obey the law of Moses. The, the must there, the word day, the must there means it is of divine necessity. 
It is of divine necessity. They must be circumcised. And they must be required to obey the law. So, basically this. Gentiles can be Christians. Gentiles can be Christians. But they must first become Jews. These are Christians who believe this. We're, we're, we're not moving forward. We're going back. Gentiles, fine. We will accept Gentiles as Christians. But first, they must become Jews. And what this council represents is a new day. A new era. A watershed moment. This council says no. No. Gentiles do not have to become Jews. They can be Christians, like Jews are Christians, without becoming a Jew themselves. So what this watershed moment means, as they navigate through this, is that there will be, from this day forward, there will be diversity among Christians. Deep long-held convictions will still happen among those Jews. But they cannot impose those deep, long-held convictions on everybody. There will be diversity from this day forward on matters that are not the gospel. There's the gospel and that's immovable. That's stone. It's not up for discussion. It's non-negotiable. Right after that, there's going to be diversity. So, the church is not a monolithic block. The church from this day forward has different expressions and yet there is uniformity regarding the gospel and diversity after that so now we move into the response that's the that's the problem that's the setup um, in one, in, in one sense, the Gentiles must be, where the, 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 the demand is this, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. Those are really sort of the same two things. Circumcision becomes the sign of the covenant. Circumcision is the indicator that you're God's people. But now that you're God's people, and you've indicated such with this sign, you are required to keep the whole law of Moses. So that's the setup. And those aren't so much really two distinct things as they are sort of um, part A and B of the same thing. So, the response. Chapter 15, verse 6. The elders and the apostles met to consider this question. After much discussion which seems to indicate that we don't have the whole, we don't have everything here. I mean, if, if that's the case, this could be read in about two minutes. The council lasted, okay, it's well been over. <laughs> but there was much discussion. And, and, and what we have is actually the, uh, kind of the, the results. What we have here are, is, is, is more the, the summation and the conclusion because it doesn't look like as you read, as you read this, that this, there's this side, there's this thought, there's this thought. You don't see all the different thoughts represented here. You really just sort of zero in on Peter made his case, Paul and Barnabas made their case, James solved it for us. So there's a little kind of a tipping of the hand in Luke saying, we're going to give a summary of the results of this thing. And we're going to show the victorious position because all the positions aren't really all that represented here the elder, uh, apostles and elders met to dis to consider this question and after much discussion 
So what all was said after much discussion before Peter got up? A lot. I like that. As when I think of when I think of Paul, I think of boy. You, 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 if you start messing with uh, grace and the gospel, don't you know it would have been? Uh, don't you know? Okay, I know. <laughs> I'm convinced in my soul that Paul had a hard time listening to all that discussion. Knowing what he knows from the vision uh, on the Damascus Road. Knowing what he knows, having seen the Spirit of God Almighty come upon uncircumcised Gentiles. Here's what I'm admitting here. This is good for me. This is good for me. This is good for me to know that Paul sat there. Biting his tongue and sitting on his hands. <laughs> because there... He, as far as I can tell, he endured a lot of discussion about this. And me and my immature self would say, what's there to talk about? <laughs> but it says something about the, the grace and the patience and the manifestation of the Spirit of God in Paul that he will defer, and that he will listen, and then he will listen, and then he will listen. Now that's sort of between the lines here. But it looks like that's exactly what he did. First of all, by allowing and deferring to the Jerusalem apostles and elders in the first place. And then by listening to much discussion. Matt. Yeah. And to allow everyone to vent what they want to vent. You know? The last thing Paul wants to do, and if you see what he continues to do with his ministry after this moment, the last thing Paul wants to do is start a splinter group up in Antioch. So the, the men come from Judea and say they have to be circumcised. What if Paul had said, well, you go back to Judea and tell them? <laughs> well, then... There goes Christianity. There goes Christianity right out of the blocks. Paul is going to submit. And he's going to entrust that the same Holy Spirit that has come upon the Jews and the Gentiles will prevail here. And he will not let there be Christianity A and Christianity B. And one of them's right and one of them's wrong. There's going to be Christianity and some of them are circumcised and some of them aren't. That's what happens. But they are one in Christ Jesus. They are one in Christ Jesus. And Paul doesn't want there to be two brides. Yes, sir. Chapter 10. That's what we're talking about. It is. It is. And Peter's going to bring it up again, isn't he? He pretty well says it there. That's right. That's exactly right. So that's that's what that's what that's going to be the the linchpin. Is that Peter's going to uh, report what they already knew to be the case as much as ten years ago? So they met to discuss it, and then Peter gets up and and. And as Bobby says, he, he points us back to the truths that we find in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11. So in effect, this is the third time Luke, the author, is going to tell the Cornelius story. You understand? He tells the Cornelius conversion story in chapter 10. Peter basically repeats the whole thing, reporting it to people in chapter 11. And now here at the Jerusalem Council, Peter's going to uh, summarize that story once again. So the Cornelius story sets the stage for sets the stage for 
the results of the Jerusalem Council. So Peter got up and addressed them. By the way, how many times have you read that in Acts? So Peter got up <laughs> and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice. This is very, uh, this is a, um, this is a theme as well, that God's sovereign choice, God choosing, like God, trusting God to replace Judas, God choosing, through the foreknowledge of God, you did this or that, um, Peter says. God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. So, if break this down, basically, God chose from among you. God chose from among this leadership group in Jerusalem. Who did he cho choose? He chose Peter. God chose from this leadership group in Jerusalem. Me and my mouth. He chose me and my mouth to tell the message to the Gentiles some time ago. You know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. So, we're basing it on the gospel. This is the essential stuff here. That they heard the gospel from my mouth as God set me apart from the rest of the Jerusalem leaders. They heard the gospel from my mouth and they believed. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. So, let's not think of Peter as setting himself forward either. He's not setting himself forward as this uh, kind of um, pioneering apostle. This is all God. God chose me. God had me, God sent me, and then God showed me that he has accepted them. God has included them. Would the Holy Spirit of God indwell that which is unclean? The Holy Spirit of God? No, God revealed to me that he accepted them. And he made no distinction between us and them. Whatever manifestation of the Holy Spirit that was given to the Jews, it was given to the Gentiles. And there was not a distinction. For he purified their hearts by faith. He purified their hearts by faith. He made them clean by faith, not by circumcision. Now then... Why do you try to test God? Who, who are we to judge God? <laughs> to say, uh, God, you got, you got it mixed up here. What, what are you doing, God? Um, accepting some, somebody and including somebody who's not circumcised? God, sit down, let me tell you something. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 17. How about Exodus 12? Who are we to test God? Why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. I don't know that it's necessarily a negative teaching about the law, but it's certainly a negative take on our ability to keep the law. And then he says, no. No, we believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Now Peter's meddling. Not only, whoo, not only are the Gentiles saved by grace, so are we, the Jews. Peter says. 
We believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Now they become sort of the reference point. The whole assembly became silent. So implying that there was back and forth and back and forth, you know, it was very heated and animated and it was much discussion. But then the whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul. Again, I love that Barnabas and Paul first listened to them. Huge, huge, huge insight for somebody who struggles with listening when I really, really, really disagree. I want to grow. And then they listened to Paul. Paul and Barnabas telling about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. He's basically just echoing what Peter said about Cornelius. And that same thing is happening through the ministry of Paul and Barnabas as well. Once again, this is not Peter. This is not Paul. It's not about Peter, Paul, and Barnabas, the change agents of the church. This is God. This is what God has shown Peter, and it took some effort. This is what Paul, God has shown Paul, and it took some effort. And having broken through the thick skulls of Peter and Paul, God is now trying to show this counsel through testimony. When they finished, James spoke up. So first of all, boy, I mean, these are some heavy hitters. First of all, Peter sits down. Then Paul and Barnabas sits down. Now James. James spoke up. Brothers, listen to me. Simon, or even Simeon, in reference to uh, Peter, has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. Now, he's, 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 he's basing it on the testimony of Peter and Paul and their experience of the Holy Spirit, what God has shown them. But he's also going to ground this in Scripture. So he's going to quote from several passages here, the Greek version of Amos 9, 11 and 12, which it might even actually show quite a bit of sensitivity that James probably an Aramaic speaker who loves his Aramaic scriptures, is going to quote from the Greek Bible, which is a little bit, uh, actually got, has some differences in chapter breaks up, break up and organization. All right, that's the second bell. But the, the, the final, I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up this way, the final solution, the final uh, resolve comes from James who did not see all the same things that Peter and Paul and Barnabas saw, and who himself is not an apostle, but he is the strongest, uh, he seems to be the, the vocal uh, leader of the church there, the elder. And he sums up the testimony, what we should learn from Paul and Peter, and he sums up what we can learn actually that Scripture, Scripture all along has been pointing to this day, when the Gentiles would be included. And so next week, or not next week, no Bible class next week. It's a special, uh, special service that will combine Bible class and, and worship. But when, whenever I get to teach again, we'll look at the, the, uh, the conclusion and the uh, resolution that came from that and the letter that they sent out to the churches regarding the Gentiles and circumcision and idolatry. Okay, God bless.